58th live webinar on orthopedic principles. And today we are going to discuss about scaphoid fractures, slack, and snack wrist. We are back with our stellar faculty, Dr. Saurabh Agarwal from the United Kingdom. Over to you, Dr. Agarwal. Uh, yeah. Once again, uh, Dr. Hitesh, I'm very grateful uh, for your kind invitation and this opportunity. Uh, and thank you all uh, for taking out your time today. So our topic today is uh, scaphoid fracture, slack wrist, and snack wrist. So this is a fairly big and exhaustive talk, uh, topic. Uh, I'll try and simplify it as much as I can. So uh, yeah, this is my hospital, Princess Royal, for those of you who are on live, sort of live screen from India. Uh, I'm an upper limb surgeon and sort of shoulder and hands uh, is where I specialize. Uh, right, so. Right, okay, so scaphoids. The mechanism of injury is hyperextension. That's very important, hyperextension radial deviation. So what happens is, as you can see here, proximal pole is very snug in the fossa. It gets locked. Distal half of the scaphoid is free to move. And that's why uh, sort of it keeps moving dorsally and there's a fracture. Uh, other thing, if you're very clever and appreciate the anatomy of radio scapho capitate ligament, that's, it acts as a sling. And that's why you get that classical uh, sort of a waist uh, fracture. Now, other thing with hyperextension is, uh, so this injury is gonna be very common in uh, footballers, uh, goalkeepers, because when they catch the football, their hand goes into hyperextension and this will happen. Similarly, linesmen in, uh, in a game of football. Or occasionally I will see uh, spectators in a football match. Uh, they will come to me uh, saying, oh, I went, I caught a football in a match and I had, I've got pain now. Because again, classically hand goes into hyperextension and then uh, they will uh, end up with a scaphoid injury. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a lot more theory because as I said, there's a lot to discuss here. Theory, I'm sure all of you guys know. But just very briefly, Herbert classification. Uh, Again, type A is stable fractures. So A1 is a tubercle fracture, A2 will be any incomplete waste fracture. Now B, uh, B1 will be a distal pole, B2 is a waste, B3 is a proximal pole, B4 is transcaphoid paral unit injuries. Then there's also a B5, which is a comminuted scaphoid. And then there's a type C, which is a delayed union and a type D, which is a non-union scaphoid. Important thing here is uh, this classification does help you in the treatment. For example, if it's a B2, which is a waste fracture, which is displaced, then patient needs a surgery. All B3s need surgery, all B4 needs surgery, B5 needs surgery, delayed union and non-union will need surgery. So think of our classification like that. Uh, it may help you to remember. Uh, so these are the few things which we're going to discuss in the coming few slides. Diagnosis, investigations, uh, what are the indications to fix? Now, this is an exam question. You'll be shown an x-ray of a scaphoid, and then you'll be asked, what are the indications uh, uh, when you will fix a scaphoid fracture? So that's important. Techniques, approaches, and then immobilization, plaster immobilization. So we're gonna see them in the next coming slides. Uh, clinical diagnosis. Now, most important here is, what I want you to appreciate here is, it is an intra-articular fracture. That's very important. The reason being a hydrostatic pressure in the wrist. So whether you fix a scaphoid or manage it non-operatively, important is for you to tell your patients not to clench fist very hard because when they are doing this, it generates a lot of hydrostatic pressure in the wrist. So that, uh, that fluid tends to seep into the fracture site and it'll cause delayed union or non-union. And this is the reason 
in a non-union scaphoid, you get cysts, like in a hip. So remember that point, it's an intraarticular fracture. Rest, you know where to feel on scaphoid tubercle and anatomical snuff box. Then in terms of other thing to remember is a one in six, one in seven scaphoids initially uh, will not show up on an X-ray. So if in doubt, if there's a localized swelling on the anatomical snuff box with pain, give, give your patients a plaster cast, a slab for two weeks, bring them back, do another repeat X-ray. Even then, if it doesn't show up, a patient is clinically tender, then you need to get an MRI scan. Uh, so in terms of investigations, let's start with x-rays and then we'll see what other modalities. Again, these next two, three slides are important in the sense, scaphoid, unlike, unlike any other bone, you need to get four views at least, not two views, four views. So which are those four views? So first is your PA, wrist view with wrist in ulnar deviation. Uh, like we were saying last Sunday, ulna, uh, PA view, not AP view. PA because ulnar styloid is the most ulnar most structure in a PA view. Uh, and why ulnar deviation? Because that's when scaphoid is fully extended. Remember, it's a bean shaped bone. Uh, and when it's fully extended, you can see the whole body of scaphoid. So if I were to give you one X-ray to diagnose a fracture, then it has to be a PA ulnar deviation view because you can see the whole scaphoid. Uh, lateral view, lateral view, you can't see a lot. As you can see here, scaphoid is superimposed on lunate, where you see the relation. All you do in lateral view is you see your scaphoid lunate angles and the relationship of your proximal pole of scaphoid to your lunate. So if you have scaphoid lunate ligament injuries, scaphoid will tend to come out dorsally. So you see that relation between lunate and scaphoid. 45 degree supination. Now this is a very important view uh, to see the proximal pole of scaphoid. So if you see carefully here, distal pole is all superimposed. I can't comment on distal pole, but I can see the whole proximal pole. Importance being when you put a screw in your, in your theaters, you need to center your wire uh, right here, if you can, in the sort of uh, middle of your proximal pole. So this is the view you're going to ask for from your radiographer when you're fixing your scaphoid. Uh, then 45 degrees pronation view. Now, so now if you see here carefully, you cannot see the proximal pole. All I can see is sort of distal half of scaphoid. So unless I get a pronation view, I cannot comment on distal pole. Again, when you're putting your screws, this is the view you look for uh, to center your screw. And this is the view you look for and ask for in theaters to make sure your screw is not prominent uh, distally. So pronation views and supination views. And I'll keep harping on that as we go along and we see more x-rays. Uh, so yeah, so one is x-rays, then MRI. So as, as I was saying, at two weeks, if patient is still tender, you carry on with plaster, plaster cast, and you ask for an MRI. Uh, the reason being MRI is 100% sensitive. And if even if there's no fracture, there's just edema, like an incomplete waste fracture, it'll pick up. Other advantage of MRI is scaphoid unit ligament injury. So with a hyperextension injury, you can either damage your scaphoid or rupture your scaphoid unit ligament. And clinically, it's very hard to distinguish between the two. So MRI will tell you that. And then uh, CT again, CT is very important for scaphoids. So for all the non-union scaphoids, uh, you will be able to see your humpback deformities. Very important because it gives you an idea how much to correct, how much graft you need. And CT will tell you prognosis in the sense, uh, if your fracture is proximal, the more proximal it is, the worse the prognosis. So you can tell your patient with a lot of assurity. Fracture type, so not all fractures are very clear. They don't have a clear pattern. For example, you may have a fracture which you think is more towards waist, but when you see your 3D CT scans and your coronal and sagittal and axial cuts of CT, fracture line may be exiting very proximally. Uh, so, so those are the ones which are more proximal pole than waist. So CT and healing, of course, 
again at six weeks, if there's a waist scaphoid fracture, uh, someone young. Now remember scaphoid two third is covered with cartilage. So even at three months on X-ray, I cannot tell my patients that, okay, I cannot assure my patient that their scaphoid is healed. So if patient is clinically very tender at around six weeks when plaster comes off, that's the time I would get a CT scan because I don't want to carry on with scaphoid cast more than six weeks in a waist. So CT plays a big role uh, in scaphoid injuries. It's very important to appreciate that fact. Plaster immobilization, that's another question that can come up. Do you want to give your patients a Collies type cast or a scaphoid type cast? Now, or is it going to be above elbow or a below elbow? So the answer is it's going to be below elbow and it's going to be a Collies type cast. The reason being, uh, so with Collies type cast, as you can see, patient can mobilize thumb. Now, even, uh, so with thumb movements, they've done studies and found out that when patient is moving thumb, i.e. patient is in a Collies cast, there is some movement at the scaphoid fracture site. So it's not enough to stop healing. And that's why there is no need to immobilize thumb. Uh, of course, for some reason, in a proximal pole, if you manage it non-operatively, remember all proximal poles should be treated surgically, but let's say patient doesn't want it or medical issues, then yes, you can give a, a sort of a scaphoid cast. Otherwise, there's no role of scaphoid cast. Indications. Uh, well, one more point to add. Obviously, if you do a proximal pole fixation, a non-union fixation, or if it's a very proximal pole fracture, in those cases also I'll give a, uh, a, scaph a scaphoid cast because I don't want any movements in my proximal pole non-unions, no matter how small. Then, yeah, so let's come to the indications. So this is one question you'll be asked in the exam. So if you remember Herbert classification, uh, so carpal fracture dislocations, this is your transcaphoid parry units, Herbert B4, all of them need, needs to be done. Displaced fractures. Displaced means your Herbert B2 waist, but if it's displaced. Now question, so you can be asked, how do you define displacement in scaphoid? Displacement is one millimeter. Now it's hard to measure a millimeter on an X-ray. So the answer, logical thing to say is millimeter, i.e. if I can see any displacement on an X-ray in scaphoid, to me, that is a displaced fracture. Other thing is your intra-scaphoid angle is normally around 30, but if you you get a humpback type deformity, an acute fracture, i.e. the distal pole flexes, that's a reason to operate and correct the orientation of scaphoid. Fractures through cysts. So we know in wrist bones, where there's any wrist bone, they can have cysts, uh, like renal cyst or a liver cyst. If there's a fracture through a cyst, you want to operate on them. Proximal pole, all proximal poles needs to have, needs to be operated upon. There's a 30% non-union chance, one in three patients. If you treat it with a plaster, it won't heal up. 30% is very high, so all of them need surgery. And then delayed presentation. Any patient who comes to you after a month waist, proximal pole, any fracture, except if it's a very distal pole or a tubercle or an incomplete fracture. So they, those are the ones which have a very high rate of non-union. So those are the ones you need to operate even if it's a income, uh, even if it's an undisplaced waist. So delayed presentation. So this slide is important because these are your indications to fix them. And you need to know how to define displacement in a scaphoid. Then another question that can come up in the exam is, what about undisplaced waste? So we know displaced waste will operate, but an undisplaced waste. Uh, so would you want to fix it or a plaster? Now, by and large, 90% undisplaced waste in my practice, I would give a plaster slab for six weeks and then get their risk going. But once in a while, I'll see a young man who, let's say, works in, a, in central London, uh, sort of he can't afford to have plaster for six weeks. For him, time is money. He's a financial advisor, for example. So those are the ones uh, you need to sit and have a discussion, pros and cons of a fic percutaneous fixation versus plaster. So percutaneous fixation, uh, 
again, remember at two years, there's no difference whether you give a plaster or a, a screw fixation percutaneously. But important is these two lines here. With the percutaneous fixation, healing is a bit quicker around two months versus three months for a plaster. Uh, so they can return to work quicker around two months versus around four months without a plaster. Now for, some, for someone who's, for whom time is money, uh, six weeks, eight weeks matter a lot. Other advantage with percutaneous is you don't need a plaster. Uh, so obviously they can start early mobilization. They, you don't need to call them weekly for serial x-rays for first two or three weeks. So obviously they don't need to take time off from the work. Uh, healing is quicker, return to work is quicker. Even though at two years, both patients will do equally well. But it comes with its own baggage. The, as with any surgery, things can go wrong. Obviously general anesthesia, uh, because you are doing it percutaneously like with a little stab, infections can happen, screws can be prominent, uh, screw can back out. So all those problems. So you need to sit and have a discussion with patient about pros and cons, and then he can decide for himself. Percutaneous, again, in my practice, as I said, I'll do maybe one or two, one case, maybe two case at the most, percutaneous. Uh, and the way to do it is, obviously this is a waste fracture. Again, for exam purpose, you have to say uh, ATLS, consenting, positioning on table, your checklist, your cleaning and draping. And once you've done all that, uh, first what you do is with your II, you get your wire right in all the four views which we discussed about. And once you're happy, then you create a little stab. This is a bit too big incision, but yeah, something like that, like, I don't know, six to 10 millimeters. And then your screw goes in basically, uh, and that's it. Other question here, that's why I put these screws on this slide. Uh, yeah, another thing to remember is whatever you measure, take four less. That's important because you will be causing some compression here. Second important point, these screws. You will be asked or you may be given a screw and asked what is this screw or what screw do you use in a scaphoid? So the answer is it's a variable pitch screw. So whether you take something like this, an accumate screw, which has a continuous variable pitch and you can see the lead pitch is more than the trial pitch. So when this lead pitch crosses the fracture site, it'll cause compression. Or you can take something like a AO headless compression screw. Lead pitch is more than a trial pitch. What screw you choose is doesn't matter. What matters is it's a variable pitch screw. And how does a variable pitch works? That's important. How does it cause compression? Uh, then, so we've spoken about plasters, we've spoken about percutaneous fixation, uh, then let's talk about open approaches. So for a waste fracture, we do a volar approach. And for a proximal pole fracture, we'll do a dorsal approach. Like this is very important. So in the exam, depending on where the fracture is, your approach changes. So uh, please remember that. Volar approach, uh, I'm sorry, I, 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 I didn't get a sort of chance to put my own slides. Uh, which I should do for the next presentation, but we'll go through these pictures. Uh, so we've all done distal radius through volar approach. We all know the FCR approach. Here, incision, so look at this, basically. This, this is all you need to fix a straightforward scaphoid waste. If you need a graft, you need to just extend this incision two more centimeters proximally. So distal radius incision is somewhere there, and you follow it down to scaphoid tubercle, and you curve it. And then you can see that's your median nerve, flexor carpi radialis. Again, like distal radius, you never go through the sheath, uh, go, go with your incision next to it. FCR goes radially, ulna word, sorry, and it'll protect your median nerve. And then if you see this picture, so you've done your skin and fat, FCR is protecting median nerve, you're aware of your radial vessel. Then if you see this diagram here, this is your radio, scapho capitate ligament. That's your main ligament, sling ligament. So when you are coming with your incision in this plane, you will have to cut this ligament. But this ligament is a condensation of capsule. They're one, you can't see, you can't differentiate the two. 
So what you do is once at this stage, with your knife, you go straight down onto the bone. So this ligament and capsule, you make two flaps. A flap goes there and a flap comes here. And then scaphoid will look at you. You can put your wire. You can see those four x-rays, which I will show you many more as we see some examples. And once you've centered your wire in all your four views, then you can measure your screw and you can put your screw. So let's see one example uh, for a volar approach. So we know that's a waste scaphoid. So this is, so you'll be shown this x-ray. They'll start with maybe one view and you have to say it's a PA view raised. Then you can say, I can see a scaphoid fracture. It's a hyperextension injury. And every time you comment on scaphoid, take a moment to make sure it's not a trans scaphoid perilunit injury. Always rule that out. We're not talking about perilunits today, uh, but in the exam, you need to rule that out, yes? So once you've established it's an isolated waste injury and it's, a, it's not a non-union waste, uh, then you can ask for other views, always ask for all the views. And see, for example, this is a 45 degree supination view. So here, you can see proximal pole very nicely, whereas distal pole is all merged in other bones. Similarly, this is a, a pronation for a, a view, 45 degrees. You can see your distal pole, but you can't see your proximal pole. Lateral view, as I told you, you don't see a lot other than relationship of your lunate to scaphoid and your scaphoid lunate angles. So, so, so we know it's an acute injury. We know it's a waste fracture. We know there are no perilunate injuries. We know there are no signs of non-union. So question is management. Now here, I can see fracture line very clearly. Again, one can argue you can manage this non-operatively, but equally you have a discussion with your patient and sort of, I don't like if I see fracture line so clearly, so I'll be erred towards operative. So again, X-ray six months post or eight months post op you can see the healing, but important thing here was for me to show you this pronation supination views which I'll keep harping as I show you more and more examples, because these two views are very important. For example, this is a supination view. You can see the wrist is in, supina is in supination. It'll not, it's showing the other one, but this is supination, if you see from my, sort of my angle. So supination, pronation, uh, and in a supination view, see proximal pole there, and screw is almost in the center. So all I'm looking at in this view is my screw tip, is it penetrating? Is it going into the joint? And is it centered? Then this is a pronation view. All I'm looking at is my distal pole. Is the screw penetrating and where is it? Normally you can't center it in pronation view because entry point is sort of uh, very radial. So, okay. Then let's come to the dorsal approach. So I will look for proximal pole fractures. Now like, distal radius, which we were talking last Sunday. Workhorse for a hand surgeon is a dorsal approach. Volar approach, you do very few things. One, you deal with a waist scaphoid, two, a straightforward volar plating. Most of the work to the wrist is through dorsal approach. So whether you want to fix your proximal pole scaphoid, whether you want to do your total wrist fusions, partial fusions, proximal row carpectomies, wrist replacements, your Von Jacksons for rheumatoid, almost your dorsal platings, your spanning wrist platings, almost everything is through dorsal approach. So this is one approach you need to familiarize yourself with. Now, dorsal approach, again, uh, after all your clean, drape, consent, everything done, then your, so if you see that's listers and you can palpate in your own wrist, exactly a centimeter in front to listers is your radiocarpal joint. That's where you aspirate for your wrist, septic wrist. And that's where your uh, proximal pole to scaphoid is, exactly a centimeter uh, in front of your listers. So your incision, uh, uh, incision is as shown, you can extend it a bit proximally. Uh, first step, like we were talking again last time, is to save your cutaneous nerve. So you, you go right down to the retinaculum, skin and fat, you make two big, nice flaps that protects your cutaneous nerve. 
retinaculum here because you're dealing with scaphoid, you just need to excise, incise distal half of retinaculum through the third compartment. And then for capsule, you don't need to make a big burger flap. You just need a small, like a mayo flap. So incise capsule here, put a vest, and that's enough to show you proximal pole of scaphoid. That's all you need to see. Remember proximal pole of scaphoid do not have displacements. So, so you don't want to disrupt a lot of blood supply. I will in fact, if my, for example, if my fracture is here, I won't even expose this much. I leave the capsule on distally as much as I can to, to, to allow that distal supply. Uh, so I'm not disturbing that distal supply from the dorsal carpal branch. And as I said, you will never ever see a big gap. In fact, more often than not, when you go in there, uh, you hardly see a gap. So all you need to do is, in an acute situation, you do disturb nothing. That's your end. That's your scaphoid unit ligament, very close to the ligament, somewhere there where this dot is. You just put a screw. See how little exposure we have done here. Yeah, that's your EPL. You radialize your EPL. You leave all the capsule attachment. I can't see my fracture here. Uh, because you can hardly see your fracture. Uh, and you entry point, you do your four views and you put your screw. If it's a non-union situation, I'll show you what I do in the coming slides. Uh, so example of a proximal pole, again, 29. These, these are injuries of young men, mostly men. I, I'll hardly ever see a scaphoid fracture in a, in a, in a, in a, in a women. So 29 year old male, again, hyperextension injury. So in an exams, you will be asked to diagnose what investigations and how will you manage? So again, you describe your X-rays, PA view, wrist, you can see a proximal pole fracture, uh, no perilunate injuries, but see important thing is here is it's a small fragment. Proximal poles are quite small. And if you see another view, it looks even more funny. So I would in a proximal pole, unless it's, it's, it's a big proximal pole, I'll ask for a CT scan. So in a CT scan, uh, you can see, uh, and other thing to appreciate here is that's the fracture line, yes, but there's, there's never a humpback in a proximal pole. Remember that proximal poles are very stable. You don't get bone loss, you don't get humpbacks, you don't get DC deformity in proximal poles. So, and again, in a coronal cut, you can see, and other thing to appreciate here is this fracture line. Now, Remember, imagine a situation where the fracture line is exiting very vertically. This is a transverse line, but it can be very vertical. And that's why your CTs are your best friends. Because once you know your fracture lines, then you can uh, accordingly place a screw. Because there's not a lot of bone here for your screw. You need to put a three millimeter screw. This bone is hardly six, seven, eight millimeters, if that, six to seven millimeters. So sometimes you may have to take even a 2.4 screw, hence the role of CT scan. And yeah, so, and then yes, it's, it's, so it's gonna be a dorsal approach in proximal pole and it's gonna be a anti-grade screw, screw because obviously if you're going dorsal approach, you need to put your screw from there, anti-grade screw. Uh, imp other important thing in proximal pole, as I said, you cannot, determine healing at three months because two thirds scaphoid is covered with cartilage. So your final X-ray in a proximal pole has to be at one year. Even at six months, if you do an X-ray, it all looks good, you discharge them. They go back to doing something very heavy. Uh, this can all fall apart. Proximal pole, final X-ray, one year. Uh, length of plaster treatment. Uh, again, no right or wrong, how long is a piece of string? Uh, as I, I was just telling you, waste, I will give six weeks. Waste, if somebody's a heavy smoker, I can even give it for eight weeks. Proximal pole, normally around three months. That's the sort of ballpark figure, yeah? Then non-union. So we've seen waste fracture, volar approach, proximal pole fracture, dorsal approach. Now, what are the signs of sort of non-union? When will you be worried? So, Important is in a waist fracture, when you're following them up, if, you, if the fracture line starts becoming more and more visible, and again, because of hydrostatic pressure, if you start noticing early cysts, you know this patient is not going to do well. You know this patient is going to delay you or non-union. So again, uh, 
you can be shown an X-ray like this. So remember, if you see big gaps in scaphoid, more or less there are non there are non-unions. So you need to describe all the signs of non-union. You shouldn't be seeing so much gap. Cis we've spoken about because all the fluid will seep in, especially if they're clenching their fist very uh, tightly. Uh, and then of course, if you're thinking of a proximal pole, uh, you will think of blood supply, you'll think of avian fragmentation, you can, and for any non-union work in scaphoid, you'll get your CT scan. You can even get an MRI to look for avian. Uh, then let's go into scaphoid non-unions in a bit more detail. Uh, so what are the causes? Natural history. So if I leave a scaphoid non-union, a patient doesn't come to me, what will happen in five years, 10 years, 15 years? How, how do they progress? And then how do we uh, treat them? Causes two main things, of course, smoking matters, patient compliance matters, delayed presentation matters. All those things are very important. Blood supply. So that's another question they can ask you. Blood supply to scaphoid and intraarticular pressure, which we have discussed about. So blood supply, you need to know uh, dorsal vessels. So your radial artery, uh, once it goes dorsal, it'll give a dorsal carpal branch. The dorsal carpal branch is the sole supply to proximal pole. And almost 70-80% uh, of the total scaphoid is by the dorsal carpal branch. Uh, so you can see uh, this is the dorsum, that's the dorsal carpal branch, and it's giving this blood supply to scaphoid. And what you see here is all the supply is retrograde, coming sort of from the waist area. There's a ridge at the back from where it comes. And similarly, if you see here, all the supply right from there is all retrograde. So if there was a fracture here or at this area, this blood supply goes. Hence, 30% non-union uh, in non-operative. And then of course, very distal part is supplied by the palmar carpal branch, which then goes on to make a palmar arch. Uh, so blood supply is important. Of course, some blood supply will come through scaphoid unit ligament also. A proximal poles equals dorsal carpal branch supply. So that's important, and along with the other factors which can cause non-union. Now, if a non-union has happened, and we see quite commonly, I'm sure in India, you will see much more than I see here that people get a scaphoid fracture, but they come to you very late. So what's the natural history for a waist and a natural history for a proximal pole? So for a waist, uh, there are two types. Waste can be a stable waste or a unstable waste. Stable means it, the force is, is stable in long axis. So the weight is able to take axial load. So if it is able to take load, uh, it will not have those classical humpbacks. It's not going to collapse. It may form some cysts because of hydrostatic pressure and some fibrous non-union. So so these are the ones which can even come after 10 years, 15 years, but you will not see classical snack. So if you ever wondered why one X-ray, one waste has snack, has snack and the other doesn't, this is the reason because they, they were stable waste. Unstable waste, obviously they don't take the load. They're unstable in long axis. So they start collapsing. I'll show you in the next slide what it means, which is known as a humpback. And obviously cysts will form, we know that. Erosion, I'll show you in the next slide. And then of course, you uh, they, they are the ones which goes into snack, snack one, two, three, four. So mid carpal collapse happens. Uh, other thing to remember, scaphoid is a different kettle of fish in young, very young people. So sometimes I'll see 13, 14, 15 years old with scaphoid. These are the ones you have to watch very carefully in the sense, uh, if left untreated, uh, not given a plaster, they can collapse and they can go into humpbacks. Uh, and then of course, if a humpback happens, uh, then dorsal spurs, osteophytes and spikes will form, which will give you impingement on extension. Again, I'll show you in the next slide what it means. So see here, unstable waist, humpback equals humpback. So that's a waist fracture, acute injury, sit on it for a little while. See how distal pole is flexing Intrascaphoid angle is almost 75, 80 degrees. It should be around 30. And then you sit on it, sit on it, a patient doesn't come to you for a little while more, it keeps collapsing. 
So if you see in these diagrams, these are representatives of the X-rays I've shown you. This is how fracture starts. And again, watch the fracture lines. They're not always horizontal. They can, they can be vertical lines. Hence the importance of CT. Uh, and see how it's collapsing. So what happens is kephoid starts eroding into the waist of uh, the distal pole. The proximal pole erodes. You sit on it long enough, proximal pole will erode more. And that's why these dorsal uh, sort of spurs, osteophytes will form. And obviously when a patient will extend the rest, this dorsal osteophyte will impinge on the dorsal rim. So uh, how do we correct humpback? So that's a normal scaphoid. That's a humpback, which I just showed you in the previous slide. So you can see this is a normal intrascaphoid angle. This angle has become, uh, has increased 60, 70 degrees, 80 degrees. So what happens is obviously because all the collapse is from the front, you need a volar approach. You need to reorient it. Uh, and this is how you jack it out. Once you've jacked out at this stage, you need to hold it with a wire. Again, do your four views, center your wire in the scaphoid once you've done that, it's only at that stage that you put your graft. So this is very important. You can't put a graft and then start putting KYs because graft will all disperse. Correct the orientation, put your wire in the X-ray. Once you're happy, put a graft, measure the screw and put a screw. This is the sequence of doing it. Uh, and of course, we're gonna see them when I show you some of my cases and then so we've seen unstable waste. Now this is a stable waste. Stable in the sense, axial load go, is able to take the axial load so it doesn't collapse. If it doesn't collapse, it doesn't progress into snack. So this is an acute fracture, week one, week two, but you can see after many years, it hasn't collapsed. You can see there's no arthritis here or in the mid carpal joint, but you can see there's a lot of sclerosis, i.e. is many years old. So these are the ones you can sit on it for five years, 10 years, 15 years, they will not progress into snack. Uh, so this is a case of non-union of a waist scaphoid. Uh, yeah, again, it's not a very classical in the sense, uh, uh, but still, there are still some findings. So again, if you're shown this x-ray, you will say it's a PA rest because ulna styloid is most ulna. You can see there's a clear displacement and look at that small cyst. And you can see those corresponding cysts in CT. So in any non-union work, you always ask for a CT scan. Well, I, have, I have put the same uh, diagram from the last slide here. If you sit on it, this distal pole will flex. Pro proximal pole will erode into the bone here. It will become a classical humpback like this. Uh, uh, and again, on II, this is a different patient, but just for explanation, I put it here. As I was saying, you go from the volar approach, you correct the humpback, you see all your four views, and whatever gap you have now, you take a distal radius graft. Uh, this width is roughly a centimeter. So you, you take a centimeter there and this uh, width is roughly five millimeters. So five millimeters, one centimeter is your cortico cancellous graft. You put a lot of cancellous chips, very thin cortical piece there. And uh, then you put a screw. So order is volar approach, correct humpback first, hold it with KY and on all the few four views, and then you pack it up with your graft, finally a screw. So let's come to proximal pole now, uh, natural history. Again, proximal poles, they behave very well. They are like stable waste. They don't collapse. They don't get humpbacks. They don't get DC deformities. Uh, but proximal pole has a problem because of the blood supply to proximal pole, they can get AVN and finally they can start fragmenting. Uh, so you can always do an MRI to see your avian and fragmentation. Practically, we do CTs and it kind of gives us all the information. But for exam reason, you will say, I'll do a CT scan to look at my fracture lines. Then I'll do an MRI uh, to look at avian and fragmentation. So another example of proximal pole so 29, I think we have shown a bit there, but 29, same guy, and you can see uh, 
so basically CT is telling you the orientation of the fracture line. So if you think very carefully, screw, you'll have to be very careful how you put your screw here because this is a small fragment. And again, one year post-op. So that's a repetition actually, but yeah. No. So again, secondary effects, i.e. natural history. So we know humpback doesn't happen because it's stable in long axis. DC deformity doesn't happen. So if, if it's not collapsing, snack won't happen. But yes, it can have some dorsal spur formation, some dorsal osteophytes, uh, basically. And as I was telling you, this line is important. Articular surface wear is unusual. So what it means is, unlike a waist fracture, for a proximal pole, when you go through a dorsal approach, sometimes you can, you can hardly even see the fracture line. Articular surface wear doesn't happen. Uh, hence, if on a CT I knew it was a non-union, uh, then you have to create that fracture line almost and freshen the edges, take a wire, drill both the surfaces, let nice mesenchymal stem cells come out and then fix with a screw. Uh, vascularized graft, I personally have no experience. I've never put one, not even assisted one. But yes, for exam purpose, you do an MRI. If there's an AVN, you can talk about vascularized graft. You can uh, take this one, two intercompartmental artery from the dorsum. And similarly, you can take one from the volar also. But I don't think for all practical purposes, vascular grafts are almost non-existent. So they, you, if you just know the name, uh, they will not ask you to go any further. So, so far, so before we go into slack and snack, uh, so far we've discussed volar approach, waist fractures, we've discussed signs of non-union, we've discussed how to fix them, the tips and tricks, we've discussed what is humpback, how to correct it, put a wire, then a graft. Talking of graft for exams, distal radius grafts are as good as eye crest grafts. So in my practice, if I do 20, 25 non-unions to waste, maybe one case I'll have uh, I like rest graft. Because if there's a really huge gap, i.e. a huge humpback, huge erosion, erosion, huge bone loss, only then will I will I take a I like rest graft. Otherwise, distal radius graft serves all, serves the same purpose and is more often than not sufficient. So, and then we have discussed the natural history of waste. So unstable waste will give you snack. Stable waste stays like that. Proximal pole behaves like a stable waste. You don't get a snack. Uh, proximal poles, you don't see huge gaps. So you do not fiddle with the fracture so much. You do your dorsal approach, but you retain your capsular attachments as much as you can. Uh, now coming to, uh, coming to slack and snack. Uh, so our, sort of this uh, representation is important here. And again, I'll repeat it a few times as we go along because this is the key to understanding slack and snack. So in a rest, the way biomechanics works is forces will come from styloid and go in this fashion towards ulnar styloid. Remember that. So that is why the arthritis starts from radial end, if you like, and go towards ulnar end. Hence, these Mayfield four stages. Arthritis will start here then goes to capitolunate, lunotricutral, finally radiolunate. Yeah, so forces come from the radial side, goes to the ulnar side. And this is a reason you will get all those parilunate injuries. For example, if you see here, you will get transradial styloid, transcaphoid, capitate, even hamate, even tricutrum, and it can exit through ulnar styloid. Or you can have Styloid is fine, transcaphoid. Instead of going through the bone, it can go through capitolunate and come out through lunotricutral. So you can, I'll, I'll go to the next slide and come back here just to harp on this point. So you can have all sorts of patterns, but once you appreciate that forces start radially and come ulnarwards, you can make your own fracture patterns, all sorts of combinations. For example, forces can just go through here and take off scapholunate ligament pure scaphoid ligament injury. And then if you carry it forward, forces can then keep going and come out through lunotricutral. So you can have both the ligaments which can go, your lesser arc injury. Or for example, here, instead of going, forces can come through your radial styloid and then go through capitolunate, come out through lunotricutral.
uno tricuteral so it becomes a transradial styloid uno tricuteral periunit injury or forces could have come through styloid instead of going through capital unit joint they could have gone through capitate hamate tricuteral or they could have gone through capitate come down through uno tricuteral so once you understand forces are coming from radius to ulna none of the fracture patterns will bother you and for all of them i've told you the approach is dorsal whichever bone is broken you put a screw you can fix it uh, so transcaphoid pari unit injury should not be difficult to answer in the exam coming back to the same slide because we are not discussing pari unit today we're talking about scaphoid unit and slack injuries now remember one more point here scaphoid like your hip joint scaphoid is sitting in a saucer in the radial styloid here so it's like a golf ball sitting on a tee or a, a think of a hip joint so what will happen when your scaphoid unit ligament goes scaphoid will flex so this congruency will change saucer is there but the scaphoid has flexed once it becomes incongruent like a knee or a hip next thing will be progression of arthritis arthritis as i've just we've just said it will start from here then it will go into this area into capital unit and finally come to radial unit so whether it's a slack let's say snack now let's say we had a fracture a waist non union or a proximal non union so this bit of scaphoid starts behaving like a lunate so only the distal half of scaphoid will flex now i.e. become incongruent so arthritis will happen in the distal half of scaphoid then it will go to capital scapho capitate because once this distal half is flexed is incongruous here and it will be incongruous here also in the scapho capitate joint then arthritis will come to capital unit and finally to radial unit now radial unit arthritis is very rare to have the reason the reason is radial unit joint here it's like a hip joint it's a very congruous joint so that's why knee arthritis is more common than hip because hip is more congruous than knee and radial unit behaves like a hip so arthritis is very uncommon so this slide is very important to understand force transmission slack and snack a lot of times i've seen uh, sort of exam going candidates uh, they get very confused with slack and snack staging they are actually the same because force transmission is the same only difference is in a snack this part of scaphoid starts behaving like a lunate there's absolutely no other difference so uh, for example i've just put a slide here just uh, sort of to what we were discussing at the moment uh, just at that time read so it, this is a transradial styloid scapho lunate injury and if you take it one step further it could have been a luno tricuteral also or a or a or a tra or a capitate fracture and a tricuteral fracture or a ulna styloid fracture so it could have gone in any shape so one one thing to learn here is any radial styloid fractures because they are quite common bread and butter fractures in clinic you must look for any associated ligament or carpus carpal bone fractures or a pari unit injury and then of course the this has the classical signs the terry thomas sign i.e. the increased gap you can see scaphoid is flexed which you can appreciate very well here scaphoid is flexed here uh, and scap lunate scaphoid scapho lunate angle is more than 90 actually and as i was telling you on the lateral view see where the lunate is and see where the scaphoid proximal pole is normally scaphoid should be sitting inside lunate that relationship is gone so this is what you appreciate in a lateral view so let's see some examples uh, of scaphoid lunate injury to start with then we'll go to slack so 50 54 year old female she came in with acute scaphoid lunate ligament injury now unlike the previous slide where is a bando scaphoid lunate here if you see is not very classical all i could see was a little triangular gap and so but she had marked swelling and pain over scaphoid lunate ligament as i told you scaphoid lunate is a centimeter distal to lister's tubercle you can palpate it so i said okay fine uh, one option was to get an mri scan i did get an mri scan it suggested a injury but they were it was a bit inconclusive they were not sure whether it was a complete injury or a partial so i took her for a scope these are the slides from the scope 
and if you see this is lunate this is k48 and you can see there's a huge gap huge gap you don't need to know this for exam but this is a stage 3 uh, which I'll show you in the next slide what I mean. But bottom line is, is, is a injury, scaphoid lunate ligament injury. This is a injury enough for me to do an open scaphoid lunate ligament repair. So what did we do? Again, dorsal approach. And then important is we know scaphoid flexes, lunate extends, DC deformity. So I need to correct their orientation first. That's the first step. So you put these two wires, joystick wires, wire in scaphoid, viral unit, you correct scaphoid flexion unit extension. Once you've got your DC corrected, you need to now control that. So radial styloid, good centimeter incision to protect your superficial radial nerves. Wire comes from scaphoid to lunate, wire comes from scaphoid to capitate. So that will now control your orientation. Once I'm happy with that, these two joysticks stick wires come out. Now, if I leave it at that, if I don't put these two anchors, my ligament will heal up very nicely because these two wires can hold my scaphoid and lunate in the right orientation. So why put these two anchors? The reason is capsule still has to, because capsule has come off the, the, the dorsum of the radius. So these two anchors with the sutures, you take bites in capsule and you tie your knots on top on dorsum of capsule. So it slaps the capsule onto my carpus and allows those septa to form again, capsulodesis. So this is a technique I use, washing line technique. Of course, there are many other techniques described. And then same in lady, uh, ear post-op. Why ear post-op? Because scaphoid unit ligament in, uh, can stretch out. So after a year, uh, I know my uh, sort of my gap is okay. And most important, look at the lunate. Uh, lunate is pointing up, it's not extended. Look at the scaphoid. My scaphoid unit angle is absolutely right, 45, 50 degrees. So this is that's why you see them at one year and you discharge them. So scaphoid unit, I was showing you from mid carpal joint, uh, the scaphoid unit ligament. You don't need to know this Geisler classification. But important thing is like ankle sprains. It can be mild, moderate, severe, isn't it? Mild sprain is swelling, moderate is a bit of bruising and severe is marked bruising and swelling. Same with scaphoid unit ligament. So if you see stage one, it's just a bit of, uh, sorry, stage one, you just see a few sort of fibers which are toned, two bit more toned, three is what I showed you last picture and look at the stage four. So compare stage one to stage four. That's your scaphoid, that's your lunate, mid carpal joint and I can put my whole scope into radiocarpal joint. It's so such a big gap. Complete rupture, just a few fibers gone. So all I want you to appreciate is careful you know, it can, like your ankle, like any ligament in the body can have a partial sprain or a complete sprain. If it's type one and type two, you don't need to fix them, repair them. Type three and four, you need to repair them. Otherwise they will progress into slack. Deli I've deliberately put this slide again to revise. So slack is ligament goes, scaphoid flexes, this orientation will change, this orientation will change. The wave forces go arthritis starts at this end, goes to scaphocapitate, capitolunate, radiolunate, which is your slack four, slack one, two, three, four, and your snack one, two, three, four. So let's see some examples of slack. Now, other thing to appreciate in slack wrist is, at least in my practice, I'm not sure how it is in India, but in UK, what I've seen is uh, people with patients with slack, they come at a very late stage, slack and snack. They don't come in slack or snack one and two. It's normally slack three. It has sort of arthritis has quite advanced. If I do 10 slack wrists, nine will be slack three. So, uh, okay, so 69 male slack three wrist. Uh, you can see here scaphoid unit ligament disruption, as is often the case because it's upper limb, they don't feel the pain or they can cope with pain. They leave it for five years, 10 years, and then they get arthritis pain, loss of movements, they can't do their job or their hobbies and they come back, they come and see me. So you can clearly see here, slack one, slack two. Again, ligament gone, orientation has changed. Arthritis starts here, slack one, slack two. Then it'll go to scaphocapitate and capitolunate. And finally to radiolunate. Now uh, you can see a bit of sclerosis. So we know there was a slack three, but uh, 
how do I know how is my radial unit joint? So I will always put a wrist arthroscopy. I'll do a wrist scope first and I'll stage my slack. Uh, so this was slack three. I radial unit joint was okay. So if it is a slack, and you can see on wrist scope. So see radio scaphoid joint, you can see complete loss of surface like your knee or a hip. And you can see that's radius, bare bone, like your knee arthroscopy, scaphoid bare bone. And then I went to, this was radio carpal uh, scope or portal. Then I went into mid carpal joint and you can see capitate. There's a grade four loss of cartilage in this localized and here in the lunate. Lunate, lunate, capitate, capitate. So I know it was a slack three. Slack, th uh, slack three means I can do a scaphoid excision, four corner fusion. Uh, you can't do a PRC because your capitate proximal pole is gone, arthritic. If you do PRC, this will sit on the radius and patient will have pain. Yeah. So for a, for a slack and a snack rest, uh, arthroscopy is the only thing. MRI, unlike a knee MRI scan where you can comment on cartilage on MRI, you cannot comment on cartilage in an MRI wrist because the wrist cartilage is thinner and we don't have enough thin MRI slices to comment uh, with surety whether it's gone or not gone. So always in exam, if you're shown a slack or a snack rest, say I'm gonna scope it, I'm gonna stage it. Once I know whether it's a slack three or a slack four, accordingly I'll treat it. So I did a four corner fusion. Uh, you can see a trabeculae, so it's all healed up. Uh, it's an X-ray uh, one year post-op. So scaphoidectomy, four corner fusion. Other thing is, if the carpus is impinging on the styloid, you also do a styloidectomy, which you can see on your II images at the time of surgery. Uh, next X-ray. So you, uh, I'm gonna show you lots of slack three because this is what you're gonna uh, be shown in the exam. Or you can get a clinical case because a lot of patients, as you would know, can live with wrist arthritis. So it's, 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 it's a chronic sort of a wrist arthritis. They can keep coming year after year to the exams. And slack, scaphoid unit ligament is the most common injured ligament. Slack wrist is much commonly seen than a snack wrist. So slack is one thing you, if there's any dorsal radial wrist pain, it, chances are it's gonna be a slack wrist or a kind box, one of the two. So yeah, 65 year old female, slack three again on wrist scope. I have shown you the wrist scope pictures before. So we know it's a slack three wrist. And there was another problem here, if you see, there's no trapezium. She had a trapeziectomy eight to 10 years back. So the thumb has completely sagged. It's hitting now the trapezoid and the scaphoid. So similar thing, dorsal approach, scaphoidectomy, four corner fusion using my spider plates. This time I've taken a graft from radius, as you can see, put a lot of graft there. And for the, metacarp for the metacarpal sag, I've taken the ECRL tendon and weaved it around it and then attached it here. So her thumb is suspended on the ECRL tendon. And then lateral view, important thing with spider plates is this dorsal rim, if it's not sunken into the carpus, it can impinge on the, on the distal radius uh, when the patient extends the wrist. So that is what you need to check when you're doing it on your II images. Another slack three wrist. So same problem, you can see here, the scaphoid unit ligament gone. You can clearly see radio scaphoid arthritis some sclerosis in the mid carpal joint. So slack one, slack two, scapho capitated and capital unit becomes slack three. Photoscope, see the radial unit joint if it's pristine, so it is a slack three then. Similar operation, uh, scaphoidectomy, four corner fusion and radial styloidectomy. Now the reason I put this slide in lots of II images is, for example, here, you can see clearly this carpus is impinging on the styloid. So this patient needs styloidectomy, always check on II. This X-ray kind of shows you very nicely two screws in lunate and two in capitate. So, so most important is your lunate has to fuse to capitate out of the four bones. Then this image shows palmar flexion. I haven't got an image to show extension, which is more important, but I'll show you in the next slide on, on the same patient. Uh, but what I'm showing here is again, my this uh, tip of plate is nicely sunk. It's not going to hit my dorsal rim of radius. And if I show you the, so always do II images to check for the motion. Now in your wrist work, 
important is so when we grip uh, grip equals extension you can't grip in flexion it is always in extension so if you're doing a four corner fusion you know you're going to lose half the movements but you want to lose more movements on the palmar flexural side and you want to give them more, more dorsiflexion more extension because that's where the grip comes palmar flexion you only need 10 15 degrees for hygiene purpose extension you need at least 20 degrees if not 30 are uh, to grip things so always do these uh, images to check for impingements and to check for extensions and then if i show you is the same patient one, after one year this slide shows you all the bridging trabecular is nicely healed and all the nice screws but now you can see the extension so he can extend uh, very nicely to 30 40 degrees and this is not him like this is him going for a casual x ray not trying to extend and show me how much extension he gets so you have to aim for uh, for at least 20 degrees same with total wrist fusions you're going to fuse them fuse them in a bit of extension around 15 degrees 20 15 degrees 20 degrees if you fuse them straight uh, they won't have a good function and they're not happy and you have to go and revise them so few tips with four corner fusions those of you who want to become hand surgeons check all the movements make sure your screws are in unit and capitate Make sure they get more extension than flexion. Make sure this is not impinging on the dorsal rim. Uh, again, I have just put this slide not sort of just to show you dorsal impingement. So compared to the last slide, look at how this plate is prominent there. Can you see that? And this obviously when patient extends, this will hit the dorsal rim. He will never be happy. So you can see on CTs, this is prominent there, it's prominent there. And again, uh, again, if you see on CT, sort of that lipping osteophyte and the prominence, lipping osteophyte prominence. So this patient needs plate removal. But because we had done CT scan, I thought I'll put these slides also. See how nicely the screws are spread. Radius, lunate, I've got two screws in lunate, three in capitate. That's where most of your screw should go. And it should spread all around in all your four, four bones. And obviously before you take your plate out, you do a CT to, to see healing also. You can see it's all one lump of bone now. So, so we took the plate out and his pain went away. And obviously at the time of surgery, the dorsal rim of radiate had huge lipping osteophytes. So no wonder he was suffering. Uh, so we've spoken about slack now. I've shown you a lot of slack three x-rays. Uh, obviously if you get a slack one or a slack two, for example here, if it was, if you, if on a wrist scope, your mid carpal joint was okay and your radio lunar joint was okay. So if it was a slack two, then I can do a PRC because my, this pole is pristine, this cartilage is pristine, or I can excise scaphoid and do a four corner fusion. So if it's just a slack one, then if I just do styloidectomy, then this bare bone is not rubbing on this bone now. So patient will be fine. So slack one, two is very easy to manage. Three and four, again, if you think of that uh, biomechanics picture I've shown you, uh, it's very easy to comprehend and decide for a surgery. Then scaphoid non-unions, uh, snack, reconstruction versus uh, salvage procedures. Again, as I said, in my practice, I only do CTs, but for exam purpose, you're gonna mention both CT and MRI. CT scan, as I was telling you, it will tell you fracture lines, it will tell you displacements, erosions, humpbacks in waste, uh, non-unions. It will also tell you uh, in proximal poles about fragmentation, about AVN, and then yeah, if you want to look for your AVN, you can do an MRI, at least for exams, mention that. Uh, so we'll talk about reconstruction in a minute, but let's uh, see salvage procedures. So, so salvage is, as I was, let's start with simple ones, radial styloidectomies, PRCs, four corner fusions, if it's a slack or a snack for total wrist fusions. And sometimes in early stages, you can debride arthroscopically. And in elderly people who are very unfit for a surgery, you can manage them with steroids uh, and with wrist denervations. It's a very handy procedure, wrist denervation. So in an elderly person with medical issues, uh, this is what we often uh, offer in our clinical practice here. So do remember this procedure. 
for a wrist arthritis. So again, uh, snack. Uh, so you can see sort of, I think it's a proximal pole, but again, I'll get a CT to see it a bit better, but it is a proximal pole, I think. Uh, so you can see sclerose ends. Sometimes you will see, I'm sure that's a cyst, but if I had a CT picture, you will find cysts. It's a proximal pole, so you will not see humpbacks. So you describe all those. And you can, uh, you can see a bit of arthritis there on the X-ray, so which you will confirm on a CT. So let's say if this was a snack one. So we already know this piece of scaphoid will behave like a lunate. So you will get arthritis here because this bit of scaphoid has flexed incongruous, incongruous with styloid, incongruous with capitate. So that will be snack two. Then arthritis comes in this area, snack three, and finally radial lunate snack four. So for a snack one, if you just do styloidectomy, this bare bone is not rubbing there. So patient will be pain-free. And for non-union, you will do a non-union surgery. If it's a waste, you go from volar approach, you put a graft like we showed distal radius and you put a screw. If it's a proximal pole, you can go from dorsal approach, doesn't matter. So snack one, you can do a reconstruction. But moment it goes to snack two, you, you can't save your scaphoid. It's a salvage procedure. The reason being, again, so that's a snack one. Now arthritis goes here, snack two. Uh, and now if I, uh, because this, this surface of scaphoid and capitate is arthritic, even if you fix this and do a styloidectomy, you still have an arthritic surface. Patient will be still painful. So it needs salvage. So what you can do is if you do PRC, because your proximal pole of capitate is fine, it's the side of capitate, which is arthritic, uh, you will be fine. Easy, simple procedure in elderly patients or equally you can excise scaphoid and do a four corner fusion because your radial lunar joint is fine. So one or the other procedure depending on the age. Uh, snack three, so snack one, snack two, three will be now capital lunate. So as I said, you stage your snacks and slacks with arthroscope. Once you've confirmed it's a snack three, then you can like your slack three, excise scaphoid and do a four corner fusion. Uh, can you do a PRC? Answer is no, because this surface of capitate is arthritic. So capitate will come and articulate with your lunate fossa of radius, arthritic surface, patient will have pain. So scaphoid excision, four corner fusion. With, so in my practice, I would do a four corner fusion using spider plates. These days they're talking about three corners and two corners. I don't think you need to know for the exam at your stage. But as I was telling you before, your fusion to lunate and capitate is more important. So whether you put a spider plate or screws, you need to have, you need to make sure this, this, these two surfaces fuse up. Then this is another case of mine, 50 year old into a manual labor job. As I said, he had a scaphoid fracture. He never came to hospital. Now his wrist is arthritic. He can't work. So he's come to me now. We got an MRI scan uh, uh, and you can see here capitate lights up. So you know capital lunate is arthritic, but look at this because lunate is extending. Every time patient will extend the wrist, these two surfaces will hit each other. And he's already got cysts, sorry, he's already got a cyst there. But as I said, MRI, you are never certain. You cannot comment on cartilages on MRI. Uh, so this was done by my uh, sort of colleague uh, uh, when I was not around, I think, but in a way it's good for academic purpose. So we know how MRI looks in arthritic wrist. So again, I did a scope and in a scope, I found that radial unit surface was gone and MRI also corroborated. So that means it needs a total wrist fusion. So that's a total wrist fusion. This X-ray is nine months. You can see the trabeculae from radius to unit and here you can see it's sort of all the bones are, are like one lump of bone. Screw is slightly prominent. I'm not worried because clinically he couldn't feel it. And if it backs up further, which it shouldn't after one year, all it needs is a little cut under local and screw can be taken out. Now remember, if you've noticed it's CMCJ sparing, I have not included CMCJ. The reason being, so this is what we used to do eight or 10 years back. We used to go through CMCJ. The problem with that is, 
is the capitate and metacarpal third CMCJ, which tends not to fuse up. And other problem is these screws, you can get metacarpal fractures. So, and finally the advantage is if you are, your CMCJ is free, it gives you five to seven degrees extension and flexion. And once you fuse the wrist, five to seven degrees matters a lot to the patients. So I would not do this almost exclusively now. I will always spare this joint. Uh, yeah, thank you. Any questions? Thank you, sir, for that uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, and it is a very difficult topic that you have made it very, very simple to understand. Uh, oh, thank you, <laughs> Dr. Hitesh. Yeah, I've tried to put a lot of slack risk to tell them that slack is a common exam case. And you get slack threes and fours, not one and two. So hopefully, uh, it's not fair. It's sort of when I was giving my exams eight years back, I know I had not done many dorsal approaches. So it's a bit hard to take in, but hopefully they'll get some. Okay, so there are some questions, uh, Saurabh, that have come in. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the moment you say stage three, that means the capital lunate joint is involved, right? Yes. So that is what you have, because I don't think you have put up the slide where we have classified one, two, three, four. That's Watson classification, if I am right. Correct. Okay. So the moment you say capital lunate joint is involved, then yeah. immediately about a, a capital lunate fusion. That means a four corner or a limited fusion, right? So I think yeah. that's the key point that you do the arthroscopy and look at the capital lunate joint. If it is arthritic, that means you're going to go for a slightly, uh, I mean, you need to fuse the capital lunate joint. Absolutely. Okay. So I think that was the key point in your present, I mean, you know, slack and snack presentation, isn't yeah. it? Two, two things, absolutely. So two things in slack and snack, as you said, Dr. Hitesh, one is capital lunate joint and the other is radio lunate joint. So if you see in this x-ray, everybody can diagnose this arthritis in radio, radius and scaphoid, i.e. SLAC2. But I do not know if, if there is a SLAC3 here, and if there is, then is it a SLAC4? So absolutely, to simplify it, scope is about looking at two surfaces, the capitate proximal pole and the radio lunate joint. If radio lunate is gone, your whole wrist is gone, total wrist fusion. If your capital lunate joint is gone, then you you have to fuse the four, four corner fusion or three corner, two corner, four corner, for example, four corner fusion. And for example, if it is just the uh, scaphoid fossa, that means the radial styloid and the entire part of the scaphoid, that is stage two, uh, would you just think about doing a proximal row carpectomy? Absolutely, uh, which, I, which is what I kind of mentioned, because then if you do PRC, your capitated proximal pole is pristine. You can easily do that. Equally, you can do still do a scaphoid excision, four corner fusion. Uh, the reason being, uh, in young people, you want to keep your carpal height, i.e. four corner fusion. In old people, you can do PRC. But for exam purpose, whatever they say, it'll be acceptable. So you would still recommend doing a scaphoid excision and a four corner fusion for stage two, is it? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And unless it is an elderly patient. Unless it's an elderly patient. Do you think the risk biomechanics is much more preserved by doing a four corner fusion than doing a PRC? Oh, that's a very important question. Whether you want to preserve your radiocarpal joint or a mid carpal joint. I will answer it. So see, our daily activity, like we throw a dart. That's a that's our daily activity, dart throwing motion, like we throw a dart. This, so what I'm doing as we throw a dart is you're starting from extension and radial deviation and your palmar flexing and going to ulnar deviation. This movement happens at mid carpal joint. So if you have to preserve between the two, a radio carpal and a mid carpal, theoretically you should preserve mid carpal. Practically, there is still a debate between hand surgeons as to is it better or not. So for exam purpose, so, uh, so for slack two, for example, you can even do a radio scaphoid fusion because uh, my mid carpal joint was pristine. I've saved my mid carpal joint, which is theoretically better. But for exam purpose, simple answer, PRC or four corner fusion. 
I think four corner fusion is a very common procedure that is being done, and it's a. I mean, you'll most of the time you'll get bailed out by that. Exactly, absolutely, because at their level it's not fair. But yeah, if somebody wants to become a hand surgeon, then you have to think about mid carpal preservation versus radio carpal. But for exam, very simple answer, which they can. And, yeah, and what about the role of uh, STT fusion? That is a, again a limited risk fusion for stage one. ST uh, stage one what slack? Yeah, slack. Slack or snap. Like stage one, we can just do radial styloidectomy and job done. Like I was showing you, if I can flip some slides, if I can find it there. So see, in SLA, in SLA, snack or slack stage one, because this bit of scaphoid has flexed, incongruous joint, if I just excise my radial styloid, so there are no two bare bones rubbing on each other, simple operation. STT fusion is a very hard fusion to achieve, 40-50% of non-union, because you're trying to get scaphoid to fuse to trapezium to trapezoid, lots of surfaces to fuse. So even for STT arthritis, okay, uh, I would do a scaphocapitate fusion. Because your trapezium- There's hardly any role for a STT fusion in today's practice. Absolutely, absolutely. Because in case you want to do a limited risk fusion, better to go capital lunate. Uh, yes, two corner. If you, if you want to do compare like uh, four corner versus a limited risk fusion, you would prefer because I saw in one of the pictures you've shown a capital lunate fusion. For Correct. Three. So, so what they are saying these days is uh, there, whether you do a four corner fusion or you fuse, this becomes two corner capital to lunate, or a third corner is lunate capitate and hamate. So they seem to think, again, it's a debate, nobody knows that if you preserve tricutrum, it sort of, it helps with deviation, uh, radio ulnar deviations. Uh, but again, for exam answer, four corner fusion. Okay, yeah. the, uh, I think, uh, let me uh, go through the other questions. And what about the, I mean, does the same thing apply to the snack? I, I know you've gone into detail, but see, you know what, uh, this is a slightly difficult area for the exam. So that That's is why I'm Try to, keep to it make clear. it more and more clear. So, will, uh, does this, oh, what is the difference in a slack and snack? Can you explain it in a very simple way? I mean, with the, there, to the stages. There is no difference. They are exactly the same. When you read books, stages one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, they have named it a bit different. But let me try and explain to you once more. So, for example, uh, 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 okay, snack. For example, snack. You can see that diagram here, Dr. Hitesh. So there's a fracture there. Now, this bit of this, bit, but let me explain to you slack first because it's easier than to comprehend snack. That's what I'm saying. For example, so let's say there was no fracture here. Let's say this is all one K4 aid and the ligament is gone, K4 unit ligament. So what will happen is K4 aid will flex. So at the moment, these two surfaces are congruous. Moment scaphoid flexes, it's an incongruous surface. So scaphoid is incongruous with styloid and with capitate. Incongruity equals arthritis, any joint in the body. So obviously, as I was telling you, the forces start from styloid and comes towards ulna styloid. So arthritis starts in the styloid. So this becomes slack one. And because whole scaphoid is intact and incongruous, so this will be slack two. And because scaphoid is incongruous, it capitates slack three. Now, if you want, you can say slack four capital unit and radial units slack five, it doesn't matter. You can name it, you can say A, B, C, D, E, it doesn't matter. Idea is to understand that arthritis is starting in this way. So what they have done is to confuse doctors for no reason, they have this and this as slack three, and then this becomes slack four. You can call it slack five, whatever your classification. So if you now think of scaphoid non-union, this proximal pole is attached to lunet, only the scaphoid lunet. So it'll, it'll, it'll become like a lunet. It is a lunet now, think like that. So this scaphoid, distal scaphoid flexes, incongruous. So obviously this will become a snack one, Incongruous snack two, capital unit three, unit four. So arthritis is being in the same fashion. 
numbering because wo, because they have named it like that it confuses all the doctors all the time but important is forces go in this direction styloid radial styloid to ulnar styloid and it is in this direction that perilunate injuries will happen obviously it's a big topic so i couldn't include it i didn't want to it's another one hour topic but wrist biomechanics doesn't change hip biomechanics doesn't change so pattern of arthritis doesn't change i think we can remember it in a very simple way either the capit number one is uh, capital lunate joint is not involved number two is when capital lunate joint is involved and number three is when the radial lunate joint is involved because treatment purposes i think that's a very easy way to remember correct but for staging purpose because they may yeah. ask me the stages so yeah because the, part one is again divided into the styloid and the styloid fossa correct so easy is to draw this diagram on a piece of paper and explain to the examiner like i have explained with my arrow i hope candidates could doctors could see it yeah because that's the mayfield's arc essentially right it's almost Absolutely. yeah Absolutely. great these are mayfield four stages which we discussed before sort of i i had a picture there which i showed yeah yeah i have seen yeah that's very Absolutely. yeah very uh, good picture that everyone should know how the uh, forces pass across their wrist correct because it de it bails you out of slack slack perilunate it makes your life so easy otherwise at, at, because i remember giving exams eight years back it's so hard they want me to know wrist and spine and hip it's, it's not fair so unless you generalize things it never comes out at spinal level okay uh, the other uh, question was uh, see there was a, at one point of time there was a common criteria that was described when you like how do you when do you suspect a scaphoid fracture for example you have tenderness in the scaphoid tubercle you have tenderness in the anatomical snuff box you have pain on axial compression and pain on ax on the resistant supination and if you have say three out of four criteria your chances of having a scaphoid fracture is 90% plus does does it still hold good i mean i i i'm not aware of this criteria all i do is snuff box tubercle localized swelling axial loading you can do take a second if they have swelling as i was telling you if a if it is immobilized for four weeks and then you pick up a fracture non union is as high as 40 50 60% depending on where the fracture was so i'll rather and even for a soft tissue injury for argument sake you're allowed to give a plaster so you give a plaster see them in two weeks if they still have pain and x rays are not conclusive i'll get an mri scan you don't want to sit on a scaphoid fracture without a plaster and if it's if it's still undisplaced you'll just continue with the cast right yeah uh, in my practice undisplaced waist equals a plaster slab cast for 6 week unless patient is young working in in finance who wants a surgery and a quick return to work which will be one in 20 waist if you like and you normally put a below elbow cast in neutral position a below elbow a uh, collie's cast and when you put a collie's cast you can rotate so it, that won't matter because you can still rotate if it's a below cast no do you do you put it in uh, neutral or ulna deviation radial deviation it's oh, neutral that, just neutral is fine okay and you don't immobilize the thumb no because again if you're moving thumb it does create some movement at the scaphoid fracture site but it's not a big enough movement to delay healing so that is why there's no need to include thumb and if i'm right you said that in a proximal pole you would like to put the cast for 3 months up to 3 months up to 3 months so up. would you like to repeat the x ray after 2 months and then uh, plan or how do you do go about if it's a proximal pole 2/3 scaphoid is covered with cartilage so the healing is endosteal not periosteal so problem is even at 3 months looking at the x rays i'm not sure if healing has happened or not but if clinically patient is non tender i'm happy and proximal pole i'll see them if last follow up is at one year and clinically if patient is tender at 3 months i'll get a ct scan and uh, generally for the approaches for non union uh, you go volar for all the non union except the proximal uh, pole right so waist whether it's a acute fracture or a non union as you said you have to go volar the reason being a uh, if i can bring up that hump back slide i'm just trying to recap so everyone goes home with a solid message it's very important 
because if you see humpback the, uh, unless you go volar you cannot correct it if you go from the back you can't correct the humpback so you have to go volar you have to correct it this is a normal orientation then you hold it with a wire like here wire under x rays once you are happy then you pack it up with graft so waist always volar proximal pole always dorsal i just told you humpback you can't correct from dorsal but proximal poles are stable they don't get humpbacks humpbacks so that's a very uh, important point that you mentioned that proximal pole is correct uh, stable configuration yes and because in proximal pole and if it's proximal pole avian avian again mild moderate avian doesn't bother me i'll simply do a simple distal radius graft in a screw if is very if is very fragmented then either you do scaphoid excision for corner fusion or these days you can replace apsi those pyrocarbons uh, you can replace them but we don't need to do that for uh, for the what example. about the vascularized bone graft that yes. is preferred again see some surgeons say it's a surgical stunt some people don't believe in that some surgeons very occasionally we do a vascularized graft that i have never seen one not done one even though i was at king's poly trauma center for 3 years so it's a very very rare surgery you will not see fragmentation in proximal poles very occasionally if i see one in 3 years it's not fair on me to operate then i'll send it to a hand surgeon who does a bit more so in the exam yes you have to mention vascularized graft but you have to just cram one two interretinacular artery or something and you just say them and they will not grill you further because even i do such high volume of hand work i would not do a vascularized graft I some mean, surgeons even say it's a stunt it has no sort of <laughs> benefit yeah carlos said i think that's from the uh, carlos edberg based in south america absolutely uh i think there are no more questions uh, saurabh and that was a fantastic lecture from your side your lectures have been really good i could see them the way they've been shared on online your the first lectures like uh, seen by a lot of people and i'm sure this is going to be yet another similar lecture thank you so much for your valuable time and the effort that you take to teach uh, the candidates who are appearing for the exam thank you for your kind words i think take home message is uh that force transmission because unless you appreciate that slack snack parry unit is a very hard topic to comprehend so i would just tell all the doctors draw the wrist bone uh on a piece of paper and then uh, let me just try and bring that where is it now sorry i think it's gone uh but draw those bones on a piece of paper you should know anyway how a wrist x ray should look like you can be asked to draw a wrist x ray you know so this x ray on a piece of paper and then think how force is travel and it will be easy i think it's called as a link concept or something no is it the link link yes. of if you go into wrist biomechanics yes link concept you need to know axial loading through radius and ulna you need to know uh how distal row so see distal row behaves as one proximal row doesn't that's why for stt if i fuse scaphoid to capitate in a way i'm fusing scaphoid to all the four bones so that's why stt fusion should not exist it should be scapho capitate so there's lots to think in uh, rays but for simplicity idea is slack snack idea is scope it not mra for staging it idea is four corner fusions maybe prc maybe total wrist fusions job done is as simple and dorsal approach three steps which i told them last time and this time also just three steps how you save your cutaneous nerve how you cut your retinaculum how you cut your flap capsule how you cut your cap three three stages and that's it that's all they expect of you no point saying i give it in the patient then i'll cut skin then i'll take away fat that's wasting time i need to know those three steps i need to like get, get the knowledge out of a candidate Uh, thank you sir once again i'm sure if if i if i allowed you to speak for another half an hour you just continue with that's your passion really appreciate that and uh, looking forward for more lectures from your side so we'll sign off for right now and we'll get back once again later thank once again good luck guys thank you for your attention thank you dr hitesh thank you